I want to introduce Robert Finsky. <laughs> it's recording now. Uh, because, because of the favorite poet, poem project, I suddenly felt it was right that I always read poetry out loud and the poetry has to be read out loud. Uh, and when you when Robert Pinsky translated uh, the Inferno and uh, Milos's book, uh, the separate notebooks, um, I, I understood that I can understand I can understand poetry without understanding. Uh, just listening, and then and then reading translation, then finding out the uh, the, the meaning. Uh, I think that the the pop the concept of popularity in poetry, the idea that poetry is not something separate from the world, but something that's part of the world, is something that you've also given me confidence about uh, by appearing in The Simpsons, by appearing, uh, you know, by being on the Stephen Colbert show, <laughs> by you know, the, all these things. Uh, that create or that, that erase the gap between poetry and the world, poetry and society. I think this is one of the major contributions uh, that uh, Robert, I think you've made to, the, to, to me. I don't know about everyone else, but to me that has made an, a major thing, but I really do want to uh, concentrate on, on the new book, Jersey Breaks, because after all, what, 19 books, this one is the one that encapsulates it all, that gives the backstory, that gives the, the, the reasons for things. And, and it all made sense to me. Uh, all of your uh, different activities suddenly came together when I read Jersey Breaks. Uh, it's a new book. You can't get, you, you have to get it on Kindle if you, or, or, or on, uh, uh, or, or actually buy it here, if you can, if you can do that. Uh, I you see I have no more room, but uh, but books take a while for to to get here, and you, I'm sure that people uh, who are try who have tried to purchase a real a live book uh, have had trouble. And so if if anyone has read it here, it's been on Kindle, uh, but highly recommended, but you know what? I'm going to start with a question. I was it's like, like a good Jewish girl. I mean, you know, you talk about being influenced, Robert, by, by Mark Twain and Ray Charles, Marion Moore, Mel Brooks, uh, uh, Emily Dickin and Sid Caesar, I just, Dante and, and 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 the Orthodox Jewish liturgy. Yes. They're all together. Uh, what creates that influence? What do you start with? Let me start by thanking you, Karen. The, uh, the things you said coming from a fellow poet mean a lot to me uh, about my work as a whole having certain characteristics. And uh, the, to use a fancy word, syncretic, uh, omnivorous, mm -hmm. various nature of American culture, something that it shares with Israeli culture, I know. And American culture, like Israeli culture, is perforce by necessity improvised and a combination of things and my conviction is that political happenings the rise of a right-wing regime the decline of a right-wing regime the uh, changes in an electorate they obviously clearly are based on social changes immigration economic things but in that hierarchy i believe the most fundamental of all is culture and talking about my own country 
and not presuming to talk about Israel, the possibility and the aspiration for a democratic culture, a culture that corrects old ideas of high and low, and indeed accepts kind of uh, mysteries and unpredictabilities in the many threads, uh, that's fundamental. I think if we can't have a democratic culture, then the democratic society and the democratic government will become impossible. They will fall. So that, again, in my own country, the appreciation for Twain's mockery of almost everything, but especially of uh, social hierarchies, taboos, provincialities, uh, maybe it will be helpful in this context of me talking to uh, Israeli writers who write in English to point out that uh, it was a pleasure for me in the book to say that when I was very young, I was quite sure that Eartha Kitt was Jewish and beyond certain that Charlie Chaplin was Jewish. I'm not sure I can analyze little Robert's understanding of that. I try to say that uh, when Eartha Kitt, kind of a grandchild of slaves, uh, child of sharecroppers in the South, that Eartha Kitt singing in Turkish sounded sort of reminded me of my grandparents speaking two kinds of Yiddish, Romanian and Litvak, uh, something about the way the low-class Englishman, acrobat chaplain, and the uh, grandchild of slaves, Eartha Kitt, something about the way they approached gestures, language, culture, seemed Jewish to me. I didn't know any better. And uh, I try in the uh, part of the book early on that parodies uh, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, I try to do the embrace of culture uh, in terms of uh, begats. Uh, maybe that'll be a section for me to read. Adaptation, as distinct from Stephen Dedalus's waking up from the nightmare of history, it helps me think about real life quirks and paradoxes. My street adjoining Mammoth Avenue with the black bar Little Egypt and the black doctor Julius McKelvey opposite across the street from my house on the White Street. I can't pretend to analyze the history of these quirks and paradoxes of culture beyond a misty, almost parodic, and maybe almost is just copping out, maybe it is parodic, sense of begats. And then I write, the English class system begat dissenting Protestant settlers who begat profit and enterprise, and profit and enterprise begat settlers, and settlers begat colonialism, genocide, and slavery. Slavery begat field chance and lynching, and field chance begat the blues, and the blues begat Duke Ellington and Stan Getz and Ella Fitzgerald and Stan Getz playing Brazilian rhythms with Astrid Liberto, and the Borscht Belt begat Margaret Cho and Chris Rock. Lynching begat the Southern strategy of the Republicans. European emigration begat nostalgic yearning, and nostalgic yearning begat opera houses, and opera houses begat vaudeville, and vaudeville begat four-year-old Buster Keaton's father throwing his athletic little child around the stage, and East Coast Jewish entrepreneurs begat Hollywood, and Hollywood begat Bollywood, long after it begat the grown-up Buster Keaton. And the grown-up Buster Keaton begat Jackie Chan long after he begat Sid Caesar. And Sid Caesar and Imogene Coca begat Harold Burnett and Harvey Corman. In my own microcosm of poetry, T.S. Eliot begat, Elian, uh, begat, in my own microcosm of poetry, 
T.S. Eliot begat Allen Ginsberg, who wrote imitations of T.S. Eliot and had erotic dreams about Eliot. So that's there's another paragraph or two of begats, but I feel like that's enough the kind of a phrase I use in the book is Jewish universalism. And uh, it's an interesting topic to me that uh, quite distinct from nationalism or chauvinism or valid or questionable forms of uh, pride. Jews have a tradition of universalism. Uh, ranging from the glory of George Gers Gershwin to the pathos of, um, what is his name, who wrote The Melting Pot? Anyway, you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and your cat is back. Um, um, yeah. But I didn't know that Sid Caesar was Jewish. I didn't know that Irving Berlin was Jewish. I didn't know, you know, there were all these people who are central to American culture that, uh, that you talk about, well, some, some of them you talk about. And, and I didn't know, I never knew and, until you know recently uh, because it's now come out. But all these people that created, that helped to create uh, my past. Yes. Uh, but Buster Keaton wasn't. <laughs> No, and Buster Keaton, as it happened, wasn't Jewish. George Burns, formerly Bernstein, I believe, was. But Gracie Allen, I believe, was not. It was very common in the days of vaudeville for uh, entertainers from uh, different immigrant groups to uh, form partnerships and so forth. And especially Jews and I Irish. Yes, very so often. You, uh, you I'm, also I'm talk reading, about I'm reading for another book. I'll be right back. Oh, can I talk? <laughs> talk. I can I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I want to ask you about because this is basic. You, yes. You talk about your haftorah, your haftorah. Yes. How much? How you learned it, and you didn't know what it meant. You didn't know the meaning of the words but you knew it by heart. And that's how you learned in a way about the sound. And so forth. I learned it by rote. And uh, I sang it in my little semi-pubescent voice. I chanted it. And <laughs> decades later, long after, it's, um, I think it's Era of Rosh Hashanah. It's near the very end of Isaiah. And it's a fierce, extreme denunciation of hollow worship, meaningless worship. And the prophet said, God is disgusted by uh, uh, when you do your idol sacrifices. It's like you're cutting a dog's throat. And uh, it's so repellent. And I was singing, ooh, ooh, was singing piously uh, singing these, uh, not very well, uh, singing these. Uh, Hebrew words that were denunciation of hollow worship. And uh, I think in a sort of forgiving way about that child and his family doing their best, I take a kind of uh, pride in it, in the uh, earnestness and uh, the fragmented and in a way doomed insularity of it. But as I say in the book, as I was doing that, there in the audience were uh, Gentile friends of my family, uh, Mr. Hampton and uh, Woody Alessi, who had the upstairs apartment above ours. And uh, in the course of promoting this book, the other day I was talking by Zoom to the very large community of uh, the poet Philip Schultz's writer's studio. and. Uh, there was someone, middle-aged person, Christine Alessi, and I was thinking of asking her, did you know that was a New Jersey name? She was the child of Alex Alessi, who was the boy two years older than me who lived upstairs. 
She was the grandchild of Margaret and uh, Woody Alessi. And um, we weren't vaudeville, <laughs> we weren't in show business, but those families, the immigrant Sicilian family and the immigrant Jewish family, I don't want to romanticize it, but uh, yes, uh, we had a lot in common. And in that town, which I talk about a lot in the book, Long Branch, New Jersey, the Pinskys and the Alessis were, my name meant something in that town. My dad was an optician, made eyeglasses for many, many people. And his dad had a very important bar across the street from the police station. And before, during prohibition, he had been also in the liquor business. <laughs> I quote, I have the pleasure in the book of quoting my grandfather's indictment for helping. <laughs> he was an underling running the largest still in the history of the illegal uh, liquor business in New Jersey. A, a, a great credit. Uh, yeah. That I think uh, meant a lot to you. Uh, well, and it is part of part of the story of immigrants in the United States is uh, sometimes they deal in forbidden substances. Mm. Yes. And, and this business of being the outsider uh, that you talk about in the book and in some of your poems. Uh, yeah, outside and inside. Uh, I think it is part of the uh, nature of American Jews is they're quite inside and quite outside in ways that are interesting and fruitful. I'm going to look for that book, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, I, I can excuse me because I, I can keep talking and you can hear me. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you about the sound um, that you talked about when you, when you talked about the Haftorah and you talked about learning uh, learning things that don't mean anything to you that that, that you don't understand and yeah, you grew up in, you know yeah. you, you grew up in, in an orthodox uh, synagogue to a family that wasn't terribly interested well, in nominally nominally orthodox my parents were in fact very secular people rather glamorous people in many ways uh they were, we were not by name and by the shul that we went to, Orthodox. And I can remember the old men from different parts of Europe trying to show their cantorial chops, every man his own chazan. And uh, I sometimes think that uh, it helped reinforce how much I liked the sounds of words independently, although along with meaning, it was part of the charm of meaning. But the poem, the poem I was going to read is relevant to what you were saying about 10 minutes ago when you were talking about uh, the eclecticism of American culture. And uh, I talk quite a lot in the book about changing names and uh, how Sid Caesar, you know, Jack Benny was Benny something or other. This was very common. It made it, sometimes it's work. Uh, this is a poem called Mixed Chorus that has buried quotations, among other things, from the great American essayist uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. The name I couldn't remember of the man who wrote the melting pot is Israel Zangwill. And the melting pot was formed in, I guess, around 1909 or some year like that in Washington at the first performance. Theodore Roosevelt, the president, stood up in his balcony and yelled, that is a great play, Mr. Zangwill. And uh, this writing this book made me interested in the uh, long rejected phrase melting pot. So I read the play. It's very touching, and quite inferior, and it's an extreme, wistful, hopeful, uh, 
ridiculous aspiration to universalism that uh, the young composer who's the protagonist, he's going to incorporate My Country Tis of Thee into his great work. And the, uh, the Christian upper class woman he falls in love with, it turns out her father was the general who ran the pogrom where he saw his family killed. But then they all kiss and make up. They're yeah. American. And uh, it's pathetic and ridiculous, and uh, that Roosevelt applauded it so. It's interesting to think about. Anyway, this is my far different version of similar. This poem is called "Mixed Chorus" from my book at the Family Hospital. Mixed Chorus. My real name is Israel Bylin. My father was a Roman slave who gained his freedom. I was first named Ralph Waldo Ellison, but I changed it to the name of one of your cities because I was born a Jew in Bielorussia. I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not. My other name is Flaccus. I wrote an essay on the theme, you choose your ancestors. It won't be any feeble conventional wings I'll rise on, not I, born of poor parents. Look, my ankles are changed already. New white feathers are sprouting on my shoulders. These are my wings. Across the color line, I summon Aurelius and Aristotle. Threading through Philistine and Amalekite, they come all graciously and without condescension. I took the name Irving or Caesar, or Creole Jack. Someday they'll study me in Hungary, in Newark and LA. So spare me your needless tribute. Spare me the red hideousness of Georgia. I wrote your white Christmas for you. And my third name, Berghardt, is Dutch. For all you know, I am related to Spinoza, Walcott, Pissarro, and in fact, my grandfather Burkhardt's first name was Othello. And it is one of my favorite lines in that essay by Du Bois. It happens to be a line of iambic pentameter. He buries it in prose. I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not. And for me, that is related to the way that uh, a generation of American Jewish immigrants uh, named their children Herbert. Irving, these were the names of authors. Milton, my own father was a variant on that. His name was Milford. His mother, Rose, did a variation by calling him Milford. So these things interest man. I hope that sounded like poetry. <laughs> what book is that? Could you show us? That is in at the Foundling Hospital. You will now see it in mirror writing. No, we see it. Uh, we see it as it is. Oh, I see it as mirror writing, of course. Yeah. Uh, at the Foundling Hospital, and the poem is called "Mixed Chorus." I'm quite sure you can dig it up online somewhere if you're interested. Um, oh, let me know, anyone, if you're having trouble getting this, which is the book I've been. That's. I, I, I would like to. I would like to show. To have shown it, but I knew it wouldn't get here on time. Uh, it just came out, and yes, uh, it, is, it is still. So, uh, and I have very good rumors about reviews and some wonderful ones, but I'm I'm hoping to see terrific reviews. I I would really like to write a review, uh, but I don't know if I have any. You know, I still don't know if uh, there is anywhere. That Karen, I'm to. very happy to keep on yakking and reading poems forever. Uh, but, uh, whatever you, know, you want me to do, I'll do, including if people you know, have I, questions or remarks. I wanted to ask you about sound because you know you you keep you say that in, throughout the book, you talk about sound. That music has three elements. That all music is 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 uh, what rhythm, melody, and harmony, and melody comes first. And you say that you know as a sax player, you say that. <laughs> Melodies. Yeah, no, no, no. people always talk about 
rhythm in poetry, and of course that's important, but it's a series of melodies. Uh, every sentence has its own melody. Uh, Robert Frost writes about this very well uh, when he talks about sentence sounds. And you can hear people talking through a closed door. You can hear the melody of the sentences, not the content. Then he does, you mean to tell me D, D, D? You mean to tell me you can't read? Yeah, a lot of D, D. And we become English speakers. Are very, we can say the word question, keeping the stress on the pitch on the first question. Was that a question? Yes, it was. Uh, someone asked, someone in the chat asks about why doomed. I think I used the word doomed in relation to Israel Zangwill's play, The Melting Pot. Mm -hmm. It represented a solving of the problems of anti-Semitism, of pogroms, of uh, the historic nightmare. Uh, it solved it with a kind of belief in art, goodwill, and American democracy. And as a solution, that was doomed. And in fact, the very phrase, the melting pot, was doomed to rejection. Well, right now, I mean, we still have, we have a future, yeah. right? <laughs> Too, but we feel so we feel so much now that it that it has uh, it has yeah. been lost. But what you emphasize in melting, if it represents not anonymity, anonymity but invention, uh, creative syncretism, and so forth, then it's the kind of thing I am passionate about. Ex yeah, uh, exactly. The, you know you. But you, your, your book is so, is so Jewish, and I never thought of you in that way. Even though some of the poems, some of your poetry really talks about Jewishness, but Jersey Breaks is really uh, a, a real Jewish autobiography. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't think I've ever written a poem that is not somewhat Jewish. These things. You're formed by them. I mean, I, when I they they did a documentary about me in my hometown, and at some point somebody says, uh, "How many poems have you written about Long Branch, New Jersey?" And I could respond, "Almost all of my poems are about Long Branch, New Jersey." <laughs> and similar with Jewish, I'm tempted to open my selected poems at random. I promise, and I bet that whatever I open to, I'll be able to explain how it's Jewish here. Or here, you name a number from one to 181, and I'll open to that page. All right, 22. Page 22, the forgetting, the forgetting. The forgetting I notice most as I get older is really a form of memory. The undergrowth of things unknown to you young, I have forgotten. Memory of so much crap, jumbled with so much that seems to matter. Lieutenant Callie, Captain Easy, Mei Ling Sung, Sibi Sisti, all the forgetting that preceded my own, Baghdad, Egypt, Greece, the plains, centuries of lootings of antiquities, obscure atrocities. Imagine a big tent filled with mostly kids yelling for poetry. In fact, it happened. I was there in New Jersey at the famous poetry show. I used to wonder what if the Baseball Hall of Fame overflowed with too many thousands of greats, all in time unremembered. Hardly anybody can name all eight of their great-grandparents. Can you, will your children's grandchildren remember your name? You'll see, you little young jerks. Your favorite music and your political furors too will need to get sorted in dusty electronic corridors. In 1972, Joe and Lai was asked the lasting effects of the French Revolution. Quote, too soon to tell. Remember? Or was it Mao Zedong? 
poetry made of our air strains to reach back to begets and suspiring forward into air grunting to beget the hungry or overfed future ezra pound praises the emperor who appointed a committee of scholars to pick the best 450 no plays and destroy all the rest the fascist the stand-up master stephen wright says he thinks he suffers from both amnesia and deja vu quote i feel like i have forgotten this before end quote who remembers the arguments when jurors gave pound the only prize for poetry awarded by the United States government until then. I was in the big tent when the guy read his poem about how the Jews were warned to get out of the Twin Towers before the planes hit. The crowd was applauding and screaming. They weren't happy. They were happy. It isn't that they were anti-Semitic or anything. They just weren't listening or no, they were listening but that certain way, in it comes, you hear it, and that self-same second, you swallow it or expel it in an ecstasy of forgetting. So you played into my hands with page 22. There was a poem that uh, gives a narration of which a very much admired American poet reads his scandalous poem, where he implies the Jews were warned to get out of the the towers for 9-11. And um, if I set out in that poem to write about memory and forgetting, um, how could it not involve not just Jews, but how easy it is to forget about Jews and their sensitivities. There's so few of them. Thanks again to the fascists, There's so few of them. So everybody can applaud and not really think very much. And 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 you kind of that growing anti-Semitism you seem to relate to, you seem to understand. Uh, most people ignore it, but it seems well, to be, you know, getting more and more popular. That occurs to me is uh, what's new. <laughs> Uh, Lonnie uh, has a question. I have a recent poem that quotes the expression new, what's new? What's new? What's new? Yes. Uh, uh, Lonnie Manka has a question. I think we should let him. Uh, Here, can, yeah, I'm lowering my hand. Can you hear me? I hear you. Yes. Hi, Karen. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, thanks for joining us, Robert. I love you know, some, some, some of your, uh, I can't help but think of uh, how, I think it was called The Sound of Poetry. That book had a big, big influence on me many years ago. And it was also great to come see you speak when you were here. I think it was like 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, you and your work have been a big influence on me. And then suddenly, as this uh, meeting was coming up, I came across another poet who's become very dear to me over the years, David Anton. I was reading a, a, a uh, a, uh, an interview that he did years, uh, only five, 10 years ago, a few days ago, and he mentioned uh, there was some, it seemed like he had a sense of animosity from you towards him. So for those who, for, for those who don't, don't know, he's kind of like a New York Jewish, moved to California, avant-garde poet. And uh, I guess, especially after reading that poem about forgetting the implication of remembering, I, I wonder what your take is on that what, what do you remember having said about that? Because he, he was under the impression that you uh, very much disliked his poem and in the interview even, su even suggested that you had tried to get an editor fired for publishing his poetry. <laughs> oh yeah, I do. I often have editors fired when they publish things that I don't like. Uh, it's part of my powers, my superpowers. I can't remember. I have spent a lot of time, uh, I'm now 82. I have often written book reviews. Uh, I've done interviews. I don't have any animosity toward David Anton that I may have said I didn't like a poem of his is entirely possible. It's very hard to write a good poem. And all of us who try 
sometimes fail in our own eyes. Sometimes we fail in the eyes of someone else. I wish I had something interesting to say, but uh, I, I feel myself leaning, uh, drifting toward a version of, of, of verbose version of new what's new. Somebody, somebody I'd, doesn't, like, I'd like to uh, ask. It doesn't like something somebody said about in in the poetry world. That seems possible. I think that's a little little too micro for me to handle. I have no idea, <laughs> but I I I read this um, on on uh, Wiki, your Wikipedia page. Physical immediacy improvisation and also the sense that a lifetime of suffering and study and thought and emotion is behind every single phrase yes the interesting thing is you weren't talking about poetry you're quoted here about talking about jazz yes i know that karen has you know brought that as a subject and you have too but uh, it, reading that quote from you is is like yes that's i would i would love to write my poetry like that and it's the only way i know how to write oh. I'm writing about art i'm writing about art that it is a physical art a bodily art is poetry and anyone who's had a body has experienced frustrations and pleasures and everything else i named there and um I can't remember if I do this in the book, The Sounds of Poetry. Here's my favorite demonstration of how bodily the art is. Two line poem, a 19th century poem. On love, on grief, on every human thing, time sprinkles Lethe's water with his wing. That 19th century poem written by a very rich, very learned Englishman, when I say his words aloud, three times at the beginning, I put my American upper teeth on my lower lip, on love, on grief, on every human thing. And three times at the end, I purse my lips. Time sprinkles Lethe's water with his wing. I don't think Walter Savage Lander was thinking about that when he wrote his poem. He was, he was making his work of art like a musician, like a jazz musician improvising or like an athlete running down the basketball court and making a successful no-look pass. He had done it many times. So he had mastered the physical nature, the bodily nature of the art. And you could call that improvising. He didn't have to think about maybe 150 years from now, somebody will put their upper teeth on their lower lip three times. He was just trying to make it sound as good as he could. And what a wonderful poem on the cliche that time flies, but wings don't only propel, they also sprinkle. What a wonderful word for what Lethe's waters do to everything. And uh, I was talking about jazz. I was also talking about basketball. Maybe I was talking about cuisine or dressmaking. It's the physical material, and you give it the quality of your soul. You talk about uh, Cassius Clay, too. Uh, that's an art, too. Yes, and it involves tremendous amounts of uh, training and repetition and concentration on physical things so well that then you don't have to think about them. So when Walter Savage Landau was writing his poem, or Muhammad Ali was doing his uh, rope-a-dope, it wasn't conscious thought. The conscious thought had been gone into it very intently for a long time. Well, uh, are we going to um, 
uh, oh, I see there are raised hands and people want to ask questions. And I thought they would put them on chat, but Jay has a question for you. Uh, I don't see the raised hands. So Michael, I, Michael tells me. I don't welcome Jay, Jay, you have the chair as far as I'm concerned. You have the mic. Thank you. Um, I, I unfortunately did not get the change in start time. So I've been here too short a time and already there's just so much going on from your last point about poetry and muscle memory, if you will. Um, but I do have a question about something you said, which I'm thinking about a lot, which is the, the relation between syntax and uh, where to end the line in poetry. And you mentioned that every sentence has a melody. And I'm wondering whether one can also think of every line, which is not always necessarily equivalent to a sentence, as a melody. The sentences give a melody to the lines. Love at the lip is touch. Love at the lips was touch as sweet as I could bear. And once that seemed too much. I lived on air that crossed me from sweet things. Before was it musk from hidden grapevine springs downhill at dusk. I had the swirl and ache from sprays of honeysuckle. The when they're gathered shake dew on the knuckle. And that in jamming on shake is great. And the sentences and the lines in that poem is so interesting. What did I say? I said, uh, uh, downhill, I had this from uh, the scent of was it musk from hidden grapevine springs downhill at dusk. Well, from hidden grapevine springs downhill at dusk, it's two lines in the poem, a three foot line, a two foot line from hidden grapevine springs downhill at dusk. But another pentameter in there is downhill at dusk. I had the swirl and ache. So every time he has a two between the threes, the melody has two different rhythms with it. And the sentences and the lines are always dancing together. And sometimes they're in unison, but more often they're in counterpoint. And uh, to do a free verse poem that has the same qualities, uh, William Carlos Williams, fine work with pitch, and, with pitch and copper. He's looking at the roofers. He, you can hear him, the melody of the, the melody of the sentence crossing the lines transposes from the key of eh to the key of ooh. Now they're resting in the fleckless light separately and in unison, like the sacks of sifted stone stacked regularly about the flat roof ready after lunch to be opened and strewn. The copper in eight foot strips has been beaten lengthwise at right angles and lies ready to edge the coping. One still chewing picks up a copper strip and runs his eye along it. One still chewing picks up a copper strip and runs his eye along it and picks up a copper strip. Yaha Padapati has a melody. And uh, one still ends the coping, one still chewing. Ah, yeah, yeah, bambi. And uh, the sentence melody is in conversation with the line melody, one could say. So um, the melodies have riffs. Each riff is part of the overall melody. Yeah. The, the poem, the first poem that you quoted was, was Retke, right? Was the- No, that's Rip Robert Frost. Robert Frost, love it. Oh, my goodness. That's okay. Robert Frost to Earthward. Right. Okay. Frost, a much sexier, more uh, flamboyant poet than his uh, stereotype. Best, it's, his best known poems are not his best poems. I think to Earthward and um, Directive are much better than the one about the two roads in the woods and so forth. Uh, the stopping by roads, stop, stopping by woods. Yeah. Uh, I, I never knew that was a, uh, a rubiat. Yes. Uh, uh, that, you know, that he's writing in a pattern. And, and when he yes. goes, when he goes freer, he's much. From Fitzgerald's rubiat, yes. Yeah. Uh, he, when he's when he's freer, he's much more, much more interesting, I think. But those are, I, I'm sure that everyone agrees that 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 you know 
that having these things by heart uh, means that you you really get the poem goes through you as you point out in the sounds of poetry. I'll the give you some frost you. blank. I'll give you some frost blank verse. He was a tremendous writer of blank verse. He was right up there with you know Wallace Stevens, Shakespeare, all the great pentameter writers. An old man's winter night begins. All out of doors look darkly in at him through the thin frost, almost in separate stars that gathers on the pane in empty rooms. What, ate, what kept his eyes from giving back the gaze was the lamp tilted near them in his hand. What kept him from remembering what it was that brought him to this creaking room was age. And that's, the cat just did something to the TV, but fortunately I can still see you. I mean, those lines, what kept his eyes from giving back the gaze, you have eyes and gaze, was the lamp tilted near them in his hand. What kept him from remembering what it was that brought him to this creaking room was age. And what happens with the vowel and age and gaze and the consonants and eyes and gaze, uh, it's blank verse at its best. And uh, he's, he's a hell of a writer. Unfortunately, it became a kind of media star. So people now dismiss him. But an old man's winter night is really great. My my favorite poem is the proper proper witch of Grafton, but which is also blank. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, it's uh, it's pretty amazing that you're that you have that you have ingested poetry, that you ingest and 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 uh, play it's, it. It's partly an insomnia game. Uh, at night, if I can't sleep, I'll do Yeats's Old Man Winter, uh, Yeats's uh, Adam's Curse, or Sailing to Byzantium, uh, or that William Carlos Williams. Uh, and usually I can figure out, even if the memory isn't perfect, once in a while I have to turn on the light and look it up. <laughs> and does that put you to sleep or does it wake you up? I think it gives me something interesting to do while I'm not sleeping. I, I do that too. I do that too. That's great. I'd like to ask uh, Robert, um, go back to your Haftorah, okay, which I, I find fascinating. Um, the last chapters of Isaiah. Apart from the rhythm of Hebrew, of the Hebrew that you did not know um, its meaning at the time. Um, the, 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 the words of Isaiah are political protest against um, arrogance, against falseness, against make America great again, against all, all that. Did the message of Isaiah penetrate into your poetry into your writing into the way that you see the world beyond just the sound but the actual po poli politics the 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 attack against false falseness we can hope so we can hope so certainly it was the first great poetry i encountered though perhaps i didn't know i was encountering great poetry it was i did know a little hebrew and i could look at the uh English on the facing page. But I I can sense, I can sense, Michael, that your sense of Isaiah, if you'll pardon me pronouncing that way, that I'm sure is not correct, your sense of Isaiah is more entirely uh, and happily positive than mine. I can't, as as a as a deeply secular person, I can't help thinking. I think I quote it as well. I'm looking down at my book. I can't help thinking about the very end of Isaiah. Uh, I mean, I have a chapter called "Idolatry," in which uh, I talk about my grandfather Dave Pinsky's. Uh, completely, he was not religious, 
he was a he was a tough guy, and uh, I can't help but think about the passage of Isaiah that I quote near the end of that chapter. I do quote the hollow worship denunciation in the terrible final words of the book of Isaiah. The chosen few who are virtuous in the eyes of the Lord witness the doom of the transgressors, quote, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence unto all flesh, end quote. And I write, it is horrible and comical to imagine a child on the threshold of puberty singing these words to a congregation, supposedly sealing his admission into a community of worship, he more than half knows that he will soon leave. The beauty of chanting words with their meaning mostly inaccessible, with every flame-shaped character on the scroll related to breath, somewhere in that maimed ceremony was an avenue toward poetry. As James Baldwin says, quote, one cannot claim the birthright without accepting the inheritance, end quote. And the birthright is infinite. It's everything. It's Sid Caesar and Shakespeare. Uh, the inheritance is your, your particular circumstances and uh, it's more limited. But uh, that ending of Isaiah, where God says, those who transgress against me, their worm doesn't die. They keep being consumed and burnt forever. Um, at that point, I joined my grandfather in idolatry. <laughs> uh, well, at, at the point where you understood what was said, or the point where you He's read very gradual. These things are very gradual. Um, more on behalf of uh, Jewish liturgy, uh, that man, my grandfather, he had lots of wives. My father was the only one of his children who married a Jew. The others married people named Tarantola and Wright and so forth. And when I knew him, he was living with his barmaid, Della Lawyer, who was some kind of Goyesha lady from our town. And um, my, his great love of his life was uh, my father's mother, Rose, who died when my father was six. And when Dave, the bootlegger, gangster, gun toting, when she died, he went after the, uh, he went after the doctor with his gun. And his friend Butch Bruno held him back. <laughs> uh, and when he died, my father, Milford Pinsky, who had to get up early anyway to go to his optical shop, went and he, he did the yisker, he did the, the observance. He said the prayer for his father. Years later, towards the end of my father's life, I asked him, was your father religious? No, no, he was a tough guy. Was he bar mitzvah? I have no idea. Why did you go and do the memorial service for him for 11 months? And my father, I quote in the book, had a rather amazing answer. He did it for my mother and he took me with him when he did it for my mother. So here's my father who lost his mother at the age of six remembering that that young gangster, probably wearing loud clothes, went to the show with him. You know, and then my father said, yes, before it's striking. And, yes. And you, uh, you, you also talk about uh, Allen Ginsberg's Kaddish and- uh... Yeah, Ginsberg, this is wonderful. I love- uh, and that other thing I read to you, uh, I, I say how Ginsburg in his journals, he relates what is pretty much an erotic dream about T.S. Eliot tucking him into his bed at night. And uh, clearly, you know, he did these exercises in blank verse and uh, 
he prayed for Eliot to prove of his poetry. And uh, I say in the book that uh, when I first started getting interested in poetry, I thought that Eliot and Ginsburg were very similar. But then I learned in school that they're actually very, very different. And then years after that, I did more reading and thinking. I realized, yeah, they are very similar. <laughs> <laughs> but the, actually, the the fact that you 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 base you know so much about poetry, right? You, you, your life has been teaching poetry, learning poetry, and writing poetry. And you know, so, but the idea of Eliot that you know poetry is something that's like a pyramid that is based always on other you know, and the generations before. And yet, unlike Eliot, <laughs> you you want to connect all the time to uh, society, to, to culture, to popular culture, to music, to art, to, but also to, you know, to boxing, to, to everything. That combination is, um, is the, is, unique the favorite poem project is unique because i'm very proud of those videos i hope everybody goes to the favorite poem.org and say watch the uh construction worker reading whitman and the, the glass blower reading frank o'hara but um i think i'm far from unique in having a less hierarchical less purist approach to culture than T.S. Eliot. His failing as a poet and as a person was that he really had a ruling class idea of culture. Mm -hmm. He abandoned our country. He went and be, tried to become an Englishman. And he said about himself that he was a, a royalist in politics. And uh, that's stupid and repulsive to me. And um, I think he wrote great things and it was important uh, to know. But that idea of purity and that idea that uh, culture is essentially hierarchical. I already read you my poem where it's the voice of Horace, whose father was a slave, though in Roman culture of the day, it meant something different. But with Horace, and Du Bois and Ellison and Irving Berlin and George Gershwin and Sid Caesar and Yehuda Amichai, I stand with culture as polyglot, fluid, and uh, too too vibrant to be strictly hierarchical. And it goes into daily life. Yes. What you do with poetry is is incorporated into uh, daily life. The the favorite poem project with the with the construction worker with his with his, read, with his tractor. Or was it tractor? Yeah. We should we filmed him at work. That was amazing because it 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 brings it all together. Uh, um. People enjoy it. It's, I think of it as being like dancing. People will say, oh, I can't dance. I don't know how to dance. You did when you were three years old. Somebody taught you that it was too hard for you. Same with sports. All the little kids like to throw the ball around. Then somebody teaches them, oh, he's better at it than you. And we're taught not to like poetry i've learned as a grandpa and a parent that when you're cuddling a baby and comforting a baby the same effect you get from singing to the baby you get exactly the same effect if you recite sailing to byzantium or further in summer than the birds the baby hears a human voice and uh, is very comforted by being held and cuddled. And, you know, we evolved to value the voice very, very much. It's very important to us. And the infant starts, they say even prenatally, starts trying to master uh, this. 
And if you're totally deaf, then you master uh, American Sign or some of the sign language. It's important. And that it can be a work of art. It's fundamental. It's basic, like dancing and singing and cuisine. It's not uh, an arcane ornament. It's fundamental. I remember that, that Emily Dickinson has a poem that begins, I cannot dance upon my toes. No man instructed me. And then it goes on to, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, but the fact that it goes into popular culture that's not considered like, I mean, I, I'm back with The Simpsons. I was there when you, uh, when I was in the States when it went on and I, oh, here he is, uh, a cartoon character. Uh, that, that's pretty amazing that you would, that you go in and out of popular culture. Well, it's, it's a bit of, it's, a, it's my acting ability. I play, uh, I play a yellow faced, uh, poet and poet laureate who's a complete jerk. <laughs> I think that, that, that's Robert, a great role. <laughs> the kind of person who would say negative things about David Anton. <laughs> Unlike myself. You know what? I, that was very nice. That, let me end with one question, unless there are other questions. Uh, uh, I, I, the business of using your name in the poem. I knew you were, you mentioned that, you know, Ben Johnson does it, that yes. it's done, but and you do it. You, you, you've done it in a couple of poems. Yes. And you have a, in Jersey Breaks, you talk about why you do it. Um, fascinating. I think you would want, people would want to know how you, um, personalize. I mean, you're bringing it right into your, that's me. That's me, Robert Pinsky, uh, not the poet. It's me. Uh, it's, um, it has to do with my conviction of, about poetry, but also my interest in the American tradition of changing your name and which are Jewish names. I have a friend named Katz who pointed out to me that like Cohen and Levy, Katz is a Jewish name. It has to do with the Hebrew Kohanim Sadakim. I hadn't known that. Yeah, I begin my poem about Ralph Branca. Ralph Branca was the 15th of 17 children. This poem is not the poem of the speaker. His father was an immigrant from Calabria. These words are those of Robert Pinsky speaking. And later in the same poem, I talk about, talk about the uh, owner of the Dodgers who took them from Brooklyn. And I say, I, Robert Pinsky, choose not to say his name. <coughs> um, to me, poetry is partly social and names are a social fact. And uh, my father liked his name Pinsky. You complain if people had troubles. What's so hard about it? Or spelling. He said, pin sky. What's the problem? Um, and it's a word. One's name is a phrase or word, whatever you want to call it, that you can't hear the way everybody else does. They can't hear it the way you do. That makes it to me interesting to put in a work of art. Ah. That's but there's something about drawing attention to the the personal that, that you know it's only me it's not it's not uh, a poet of art you could say only you could say hey look it's me. <laughs> <laughs> it's both it's whatever that is that one feels when one says or thinks one's name Karen, you've done a wonderful job. Wait, 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 one minute, one minute. <laughs> hey, wait, wait, don't you run just, away. You just, you just gave, you just gave a, a, me a, a tremendous insight into a question that I, over the, the last um, uh, Rosh Hashanah, New Year and Yom Kippur services was puzzling me a lot because most of the services are made up of piyutim. Um, piyutim would be hymns, I guess. Um, um, sacred hymns, um, passionate hymns. 
And in many, many of the hymns of the Piyotim, there is acrostics spelling out the name of the writer. Huh? Yes. And sometimes they're hidden and you have to find them and it's like you're joining the letters and then you suddenly, the writer's name is embedded in, the, in, in, in his work of art. And only this year I began to think like, why, why was that so necessary? Why was it necessary that they put themselves into their work of art? Um, is it as a signature, like as a painter or as a signature or, 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 or the way that you've done it? You, you, you are the art, you, you, you are the voice of the art and, and therefore you have a voice, maybe. It's a profound mystery of being one and being many. Once you decide that you're going to say on love, on grief, on every human thing, time sprinkles Lethe's water with his wing, you are no longer Walter Savage Lander. You're also a Jewish American poet saying those words century later. But you're also Walter Savage Lander. Your name is on the poem. So I can picture Putin, the authors of the Putin, wanting to include the mystery i am myself i am also more than myself i am both and that mystery is profound what what were you thinking when i i, I read the english translation of that horrible ending of isaiah looking at the rotting corpses and really celebrating thing isn't it great that they are still suffering uh, I don't read it like that. Um, I, I, I see Isaiah as most of the other prophets as as crying. Their life, their lives were filled of 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 tears of 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 the suffering that's about to come because of the arrogance of the of the human, and it doesn't matter. And they knew it doesn't matter how loud they cry and how loud they protest and how loud they call for repentance. No one is going to listen and they're all going to go down <laughs> the chute. What is the Hebrew word that the 16th century translation says transgressions, transgressions against me? I would have to have a look. I, wrote, I, I don't know. I, I would have to have a look. I, I yes. don't know that off Why did you ask that? Why did you ask that? Well, because it's an element that seems not grief, but judgment in that passage. So I'm, I'm engaging a little uh, amateur pilpo or uh, argument with Michael that uh, transgressions against me uh, in the first person of God sounds less like grief and more like judgment to me. You also talked about Isaiah's uh, questioning of, or criticism of people who pray yes. without. Uh, yeah. It's without... a great, it, it's great poetry and we don't need to steal it in one way, but those are questions about it. Thank you all again. It's wonderful. It was wonderful to, to to be with you, I hope to be with you in uh, to, to in Boston. Yes, I hope so. Too. But, but uh, uh, it was a wonderful opportunity here to talk to uh, to talk to these people, all of, all of our uh, friends, and I hope we will be have another chance with your next book. Yeah. Good. I am grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody can go off mute and, and we can hear the applause. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. It's really nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think that uh, oh. I think that we've gone off mute and we can we can stop and then we have Thank you, everybody. Thank you until next time. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you on December 4th. Wonderful. Our next <laughs>